Welcome to the Tideline Compass series of conversations with leaders charting the course in impact investing, and thank you for joining us. I'm Ben Thornley, Managing Partner at Tideline, and I'm excited today to be exploring the topic of impact value creation. In short, these are the actions that investors take as owners, lenders, and influencers to maximize impact performance alongside financial return. These are the approaches impact investors take to shaping an investee's strategy in ways that are differentiated from non-impact investors. We have a great group of leaders joining us, and given our full agenda, we may not have the opportunity to get to attendee questions. However, please do use the Q&A feature in Zoom, and if indeed we are short on time, we will integrate responses to your questions into a blog post that summarizes this discussion in the coming weeks. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our featured guest, Steve Ellis, co-managing partner at TPG Rise. As the former global managing partner at Bain & Co, Steve has been living and breathing value creation for decades. Steve, we're so thrilled to have you with us for the first part of our session. Welcome. Thanks, Ben. It's great to be here. To, To get us started, Steve, you've said there's no such thing as a separate impact value creation plan. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, you know, at, at the Rise Fund, we have a, a principle that we call collinearity, which is that we have to find companies in order to achieve our objectives that, um, by virtue of what they do to make money, create net positive social and or environmental good. So uh, if a business is inherently collinear, uh, what you do to drive commercial outcomes, by definition, Uh, broadens and deepens uh, the impact of the organization. So when we do a value creation plan, when we lay out for a management team what we believe the steps are to improving both commercial and impact outcomes, uh, there's rarely uh, sort of a divergence or any meaningful tension between those two objectives. And so the plans just come up as a single value creation plan, whether that value is impact uh, or cash flow. Got it. And, and, and what additional data or evidence are you gathering from companies to establish that impact really is at the heart of their strategy formulation process? Yeah, well, w- from the very beginning of, uh, of Rise, back, you know, we launched this fund back in uh, 2016. Um, we spent the better part of a year actually architecting a, an impact measurement and assessment framework. Uh, and in fact, we built out a, a separate public benefit corporation called Y Analytics, which actually curates um, and leads all of our impact underwriting. And uh, the methodology we use forces us to actually look at all of the positive and negative impact pathways for a business, then go out and find the research, you know, high quality, randomized control trial, peer reviewed research that demonstrates that there's a linkage between the output of the business and explicit social outcomes that match up with, you know, one of our uh, six sectors we focus on. And then we actually go through the exercise of trying to find the research that proves the magnitude of that that impact. In other words, linking the social outcomes to some uh, measure of value. And we actually um, convert our impact into dollars of value, again, using a rigorous evidence-based screen. And so what that gives us is a blueprint, really, for the impact metrics that are then built into um, our plans that we work through with our management teams. Uh, And those end up being integrated alongside every financial metric. And because they're, again, collinear, they're tied to the fundamental elements of output for the business, they fit quite naturally. Um, And, you know, we do, though, overlay a lot of additional research to make sure that the specific metrics that we're focused on are the ones that have been proven to drive impact. And, you know, the truth is a superficial treatment of those uh, linkages between uh, the business output and social outcomes are dangerous. You really have to go deep. You really have to understand what it is that actually drives the social outcomes. Um, And again, our process sort of forces us through the gauntlet of of evidence-based rigor to make sure that that we get to the the bottom of what's really driving the enduring impact. 
Got it. Got it. And and once a portfolio company is in is you know in the fund, what does active engagement then look like with management, Steve? Yeah. What's, the, what's the relationship with management? Yeah. So the the one of the great things about uh, about doing impact investing, at least in our experience, is that uh, if you're going out there with your impact assessment measurement um, process uh, right in front. You're, you're being clear, you're being uh, transparent, you're being honest about what your thresholds are, what it means to be an impact investment. You, the, the entrepreneurs, the leadership teams, management teams tend to self-select into the level of rigor they're comfortable with. In fact, it's a little bit of a test, honestly, as to whether or not they really are committed, uh, as committed to impact as they are to the, to the financial and commercial outcomes in their business. So we actually expose our process very early on with our management teams, even when we're in the diligence process, to expose them to the rigor, to help them even gain insights into how their business actually drives impact. And that tends to differentiate us in the market. It tends to be a bit of a, a proof point for the authenticity of our commitment to impact. And that tends to really resonate with management teams. So it starts there. It actually starts in the diligence process. And then it's very easy or once we uh, close an investment to transition very quickly into building those impact metrics into the dashboards, into the KPIs, into the incentive systems that, that we use to, um, to manage the business. And not just in the C-suite, but cascaded down the organization. And then we are very, very rigorous about coming back and, and learning, because this is the other thing that I think is different about value creation in an impact-oriented business is that the more iterative you are, um, the uh, if, if you, you're you never really satisfied with the full clarity of, of, of how those impact metrics are translating um, into action in the business and testing it, constantly testing whether or not you know, that linkage between output and social outcome is really strong, you can miss things. Um, and we've got many examples of where we brought our way analytics team in um, to study, uh, we've commissioned separate reports to make sure that that linkage between b- between the output of the company and impact is really as strong as we think it is. And that's actually many times uncovered really deep insights about product strategy, um, about sort of how we're managing customer experience, you know, fundamental questions about, you know, where, um, you know, the pedagogy of a, you know, of a ed tech, you know, solution should should evolve because uh, it just forces you to look for things that a pure commercial lens wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. I'd love if you could share an example sure. Steve, of where that impact perspective has helped you identify yeah. a value creation opportunity that perhaps someone else on the cap table might not have been able to identify. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll use an example uh, from one, one of our portfolio companies, Dreambox Learning, and this is a a solution uh, that provides an adaptive, personalized. Um, uh, supplemental math curriculum for uh, for kids in sort of K through five. Uh, that's where it started. It's actually evolved pretty dramatically under our ownership, but that was the the sort of core of the business when we first invested in 2018. And uh, it was it's a very very impactful software. And uh, and we actually there was great research done by Harvard that proved that there was a direct linkage between a certain dosage level of the software. Uh, and, you know, per week over the course of a term and actual learning gains in math. And so it was a fantastically impactful um, uh, solution and one that had really high quality research behind it. So as we got into the uh, the early days of the pandemic, we saw a massive surge in the uh, usage of the, or at least the distribution of of Dreambox because we decided to give it away for free to all of our, our districts, um, just to make sure that we were doing the right thing. And one of the things that we found is that while uh, students were getting rostered, and other words, students were signing up for it, uh, we weren't seeing the same, the same usage patterns. And as a result, we while the, the fundamental metrics of how many kids on Dreambox were trending well, the actual dosage levels in terms of the usage per week um, as we really dug into it, we're, um, we're lagging. And so we actually commissioned a piece of research that focused explicitly on why that was happening. And as it turned out, 
the teachers um, didn't have in a blended learning environment enough of a lesson planning guide or a dashboard that allowed them to meter um, and customize the lesson plans and follow lessons plans for individual students, whether they were ahead on or behind grade level. And so we actually pulled in the development of, um, of, a, of a data dashboard and a lesson planning solution that dramatically improved the usage of the product, getting to the threshold dosage levels, and by virtue of that, dramatically improving impact. So it, it, was our, it was our obsession with understanding impact, even though we were getting paid, you know, the commercial outcomes were coming. It was, it was, it was quote unquote working as a commercial solution, but it wasn't delivering the impact that it could. And by virtue of making this pivot, accelerating the product development um, of this solution, uh, we ended up actually leapfrogging the competition. And of course, you know, as always, uh, the commercial outcomes tend to follow. That's a great, great example, Stephen. I mean, as an established platform now and impact, I'm sure you've seen that kind of thing, uh, you know, numerous times at this point. Where, where have you found that uh, Rise can really add most value to companies on impact? Like, where, where does Rise fit in? Well, I, you know, I think the, um, I think the place where we've seen it make the biggest difference, and I'll set aside just generally our business building and, and operations support, because value creation, again, as I said earlier, value creation, we're pulling all the same levers, driving better go to market, more marketing efficiency, you know, better product development, organizational uh, development, you know, human capital, all those things drive enormous improvements in impact. So let's be perfectly clear that that's really where the, the you know, the most of the value creation lies. But as it relates to specifically impact, um, you know, I would say one of the things that we've learned uh, is, and, and now why analytics are, you know, our impact sort of assessment team is uh, actually getting more involved now with the companies, actually helping them go through the kind of exercise I just described for Dreambox. In other words, really going deep on where the evidence is as to how their business models are driving those, those demonstrable, measurable impacts. And I think what people are finding is increasingly understanding that linkage, optimizing your business for it, and then building that into how you communicate to your stakeholders, your customers, your employees about what your business is all about, how mission aligned it is, the real value it creates is, is creating a bit of a flywheel effect in their desire to want to learn more, their desire to want to build more of that into explicitly into their business model, explicitly into their marketing communications. Uh, because to the truth is the world is figuring out how to value both the positive and negative externalities of, of these businesses. And so there seems to be an insatiable demand among our portfolio companies in particular to find ways to express that in their businesses much more overtly. Got it. Well, Steve, thanks so much for joining us. We, we really appreciate your time. Um, I'm now thrilled to be able to welcome uh, an experienced panel of practitioners uh, each with a slightly different perspective on impact value creation. But Steve, we'll look forward to uh, uh, to being in touch and appreciate you taking the time to be with us. In the yeah, my, it was my pleasure to be with you all. Thanks very much. Day. Right. Matthew Barry is an impact partner at Learn Capital, a billion dollar VC platform focused on human flourishing. Matt's responsible precisely for leveraging the impact of the fund's ventures to increase their scale and sustainability. Thanks, Matt. Hope Mago is a partner at HCAP, a prominent mezzanine debt impact manager where he's led the development of the firm's impact investment strategies since joining 13 years ago. He's also the president of Impact Capital Managers, a global network of over 85 impact funds. Jen Price is president and CEO of Calvert Impact Capital, one of the leading investors in microfinance and community finance institutions, having deployed over $3 billion since being founded 25 years ago. Emma Sisman is Director of Portfolio Acceleration at SJF, another very prominent impact VC with over 20 years of history. Emma focuses on post-investment initiatives and value-add work with portfolio companies. 
And Tang Zongzong is Manager, Sustainability and ESG Strategy at Bering Private Equity Asia and formerly Impact Investing Lead for Partners Group in Asia. Thank you all for being part of the Compass series. Hope, I'd like to start with you. Uh, am I right in saying that contribution is at the heart of the matter for HCAP? Uh, and I imagine for many investors like HCAP that have uh, job quality related impact goals. And can you quickly explain how HCAP works with companies and how that work differs from what other investors on the cap table are doing? Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, so, yeah, you are right. I think for us, contribution is a key component for value creation uh, at the companies we work with, right? So when we are looking at deploying capital into a company, we look to typically develop a value creation road roadmap, and we have that roadmap sit alongside our impact roadmap. So we're not looking at these two separately. We think impact and value creation are a key component of what we're trying to do in terms of scaling the businesses we invest in. So we tend to take a very active approach in working with management to implement the Gameful Jobs Roadmap. And just to quickly provide an overview on the Gameful Jobs Roadmap, this is really for us, it's a workforce development and quality jobs framework, which is part of our impact thesis, right? So it typically focuses on three main pillars around economic opportunity, health and wellness, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're typically looking at coming into a business and helping the management team deploy these themes across their workforce. So um, there's a very key focus for us on this. Uh, our approach requires sort of significant involvement. And even though we are primarily a mezzanine debt investor, uh, we tend to wear an equity like hat when we're engaging with companies. So a lot of it means we have to be very aligned with the management teams we're working with. Uh, we're having really open, honest conversations up front about what impact means for us, that it's a key component of our strategy, um, that we need to have them buy into it. And then it's a requirement for us before we even invest in a company that the management approves the ro impact roadmap and signs up to implementing it over the course of our investment. So that's then followed by quarterly check-ins with the management team. Uh, and then we're working to bring governance and resources to the table to assist in the implementation of the impact roadmap. Got it, got it. Th thanks, Hope. And I'll look forward to coming, coming back on how you implement those kind of uh, tools you know, as a debt investor. But uh, before we do that, Tang, uh, I'd like to turn to you. Um, Bearing, on the other hand, takes significant minority stakes or controlling stakes uh, in most of the companies you invest in. From where you sit as a private equity investor, what are you seeing uh, in the way of exemplary impact value creation practices, uh, and where do you think there's more work to do? Mm, yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ben. By the way, and the Tightline team for the for the invitation. Uh, it's it's really a great pleasure to be part of this discussion. So, um, you know, we're one of the largest PE funds focused on Asia, and. And Asia is a region where, where we're seeing more and more deals where there is just a clear impact angle, right? Whether, regardless of whether you're an impact investor or not. Um, and our job in these situations is, is then to identify the impact angle, right? To understand what impact the company is really having on the world, on the society and on the environment and make sure, make sure we understand that impact and integrate that um, impact angle into the overall strategy and value creation plan at the company. Right, um, and there's a couple of examples where you know, you know, I won't be able to name the companies, but you can think that you know these are things that both impact investors and just regular investors can do. Things like designing and developing a new product or service, right, to address a specific sustainability challenge, right. Things like making an existing product or, or service more sustainable uh, to target a new customer group, right, and. You know, there are also situations where you can refocus your product or service to target a um, kind of an underserved uh, population or in a new, less developed market, right? Um, these are all things that, you know, I think not just impact investors, but regular investors should start thinking about as well. And, and that's where I think um, there is the most work to do <laughs> in a way, because I think we do need a mindset change, right, in terms of how impact and value creation can uh, are closely linked, right? 
I'm sure not many funds out there are using a third-party research firm to look at their impact, like what Steve was was <laughs> was describing, right? But uh, you know, and I have seen in my career hospitals that don't know, for example, how many patients they treat every year because they didn't have to know, right? Because you know that's not that's not revenue, that's not cost, that's not EBITDA, even though it's probably the most important impact metric you can think of. Um, but if an impact investor comes in into a company like that um, and started to ask them to, to track that metric and many other more sophisticated metrics on the impact front, then maybe they will understand their patients better. Maybe they can better contribute to positive social impact. And in that process, they can become better businesses themselves. But that will have to start with a mindset change. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Th- thank you, Tang. Um, and returning to UN, Matt, um, for SJF and Learn, it seems that very targeted sector expertise is very helpful when it comes to contribution. Uh, each of you have impact acceleration as core parts of your roles. Can you share with us what levers you tend to pull most in your work, uh, adding value? And, and Emma, let's start with, with you and then we'll turn to Matt. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Ben, and the tagline team for having all of us today. Um, so I guess a bit of context on SJF before I turn to the levers, because um, I think that will lay some foundation here for a better understanding of how widespread we are across different sectors. Uh, so SJF was first founded in 1999. So we've been at this for over two decades as an impact fund, um, investing across both environmentally focused sectors as well as socially focused. Um, we've raised five funds over that history and are typically coming in in series A and B rounds, um, oftentimes leading those rounds, but other times just as part of a syndicate. But a big part of our focus um, as a value creator, as an investor, whether that's from an impact angle or not, is um, being really hands-on with our portfolio companies. And so when it comes to our impact strategy, we have had some time to evolve over our history. And Um, Similar to what Steve was mentioning for the RISE Fund, um, we start really um, the impact analysis with companies and conversations with companies in the pre-investment diligence stages. So have a pretty robust um, diligence framework that we walk through with each company and really start to work with them on talking about metrics, talking about projects, talking about levers that we think are really relevant to that particular business model. Um, The strategy certainly spans post-investment as well into three verticals of practices that we describe as impact measurement, management, and acceleration. Um, And so on the measurement front, to dive in a bit, we historically did participate in GEARS as a rating system out of B-Lab for the entirety of that product being offered as a tool in the market. So a bit over a decade, um, we're a GEARS pioneer fund and really did like the fact that using the B impact assessment, we were able to go really deep on ESG practices and measurement uh, with our portfolio companies, but we did tack on um, another metric set that got at some issues that were really core to SJF's thesis. Um, We were first founded as the Sustainable Jobs Fund, which I think is meaningful and gets a bit at what Hope was describing on quality jobs being a huge part of our DNA and us working with portfolio companies to better describe what we believe is a quality job and help them get to that place. Um, And when Gears went away, we had the opportunity to take a step back and think through what had been working well for us, um, what metrics we really did want to continue to measure for with our portfolio companies and think through new industry frameworks like the impact management project that was really putting an emphasis on outcomes and efficacy versus simply measuring for scale um, of a business when it came to impact. So um, today our impact measurement practice um, involves a group called Upmetrics where we have a backend technology platform that allows impact data to be submitted to us from portfolio companies. We can do analysis, we can create benchmarks, we can create dashboards and really offer that insight back to companies in real time so that we're not creating this black box of submitting impact data and us just holding on to it and reporting it simply for SJF's sake. We really want it to be a part um, of the value creation and a lever we can pull for our companies and them understanding their own income, uh, impact and outcomes. Um, and lastly, I think on the impact um, acceleration piece of this, um, impact management is part of that too. We define that as this concept called bending the curve on impact at SJF. So we are investing in companies where impact is embedded in the business model 
such that as businesses scale, impact scales too. But we want to think about ways that we uniquely can contribute as an impact investor, whether that's at the board or beyond the boardroom, um, working directly with management teams and beyond at companies to think about how we can uh, uniquely contribute and, and create that value from an impact standpoint to deepen or broaden outcomes. So it could be uh, you know, creating carbon models. It could be looking at carbon emissions across every company. It could be thinking about employee engagement surveys, putting in place better benefits. So we're really trying to take a hands-on approach to think about how SJF can create deeper, greater outcomes with our companies, which we ultimately think makes them more valuable at acquisition, at exit for us, um, because they are that much more impactful. Great. Well, well, thanks, Emma. And and Matt, same question to you. If you could tell us a little bit about this work at Learn and the kind of levers you're you're pulling to uh, add value from an impact perspective. Absolutely. And, and, th- and thanks again for having us. I love this topic. I'm getting so much out of what everyone else is already saying. So Learn Capital, uh, we're on our fifth fund as well. Uh, traditionally in ed tech, um, VC, I think it's important to know that when we use ed tech, I think we are broadly speaking around learning and human potential. So while we're in several kind of K-12 specific companies, we're also in workforce and early childhood and a lot of adjacencies. Also importantly, we have everything from a venture studio to growth fund. So I think when we talk about venture, we go all the way from uh, very early C to uh, you know Series C now. So we have a pretty lar- large continuum of the type of capital we're deploying, which I think creates some interesting opportunities and challenges in the way that we think around um, impact management and acceleration. Um, when it comes to the value of the sector specific- specificity that we're in, um, you know, I think we have the ability to recognize patterns around impact, um, deep connections with the university and research institutions and subject matter experts that can really work with us hands on to understand evidence building and efficacy. Um, I think one of the pieces that I'm sure happens with all the other folks on the call um, is this opportunity for portfolio connectivity. So we don't just look at an individual venture and the impact they can create, but we think about how we can kind of put A, B and C together and create opportunities that otherwise might not exist. And so again, I think that lends itself when we have a sector focus that we can pull in you know, a company, work, a company working on uh, workforce placement, another working on talent management within a um, Fortune 500, and another working on upskilling. You put those together, you can do some really interesting things around impact. And then the last piece I'd say on the value of the sector specificity is around aligned um, and active LPs. And so we have a number of LPs who care a lot about the outcomes that we're driving, um, which le- lends us um, to hold us accountable and gives a, you know, another sounding board that keeps us um, really engaged in the state of the field. When it comes to levers itself, I know people have already talked about this research and evidence building. I think the beauty within our sector is that most of our customers require it. So a lot of our um, portfolio companies need to prove some level of efficacy for the purchaser itself. So when we're working on the early end, establishing KPIs and business related goals, um, they're already lined up on that because it matters to them. So what we've been thinking a lot about is how do we build that evidence continuum from logic model to RCT over the course of an investment? Um, and then in many cases, um, we end up being that evidence broker, making the introductions to the evaluators and research partners. I think the other um, two things that I'll just quickly um, hammer on is one is, I think, taking opportunities to um, use our portfolio companies to get into underserved markets. And so an example is working within our workforce portfolio to understand how the upskilling and placement could support incarcerated individuals. So partnering with a nonprofit organization already is doing evidence-based work around um, re-entry and recid- reducing recidivism, how could we potentially bolt on some of our companies and their solutions to augment that? And then the final one is un- unlocking public funding streams and exploring out- outcome-based revenue. So I think this is a little bit new frontier for us, but really thinking about how we can get into social impact bond-like opportunities where we can be driving opportunities to pilot impact at these early stage companies um, prove efficacy, um, and then unlock public funding, things like vouchers, um, Workforce Investment Act dollars, et cetera. Got it. Got it. Great, great, great examples, man. I'd, I'd love to come back to those um, a little later in our, in our discussion. Jen, turning to you, um, as, as, as an investor, um, Calvert primarily supports intermediaries. So you're sitting in a slightly different seat on this panel. And I'm keen to know in what ways that impacts your ability to enhance the impact of your own investees and how Calvert itself talks about your contribution to your own investors. Um, so we'd love to hear it from your from where you sit, Jen. Yeah, thank you. And a pleasure to be here. 
um, as you shared, we're in a little bit of a different seat and you've assembled a wonderful panel because all of us, for the most part, come in in a little different angle. So as Matt articulated, it's really exciting to hear all this these different approaches to really creating investor contribution. In our core model, investor contribution does appear a little different. Um, what we do, as you articulated, Ben, is we raise capital from investors. We lend at intermediaries, so primarily financial institutions, affordable housing developers, impact funds of all sizes, first-time fund managers to more mature and scaled fund managers. It is those intermediaries that then on lend to businesses or projects in place. So we are a fund of funds. Um, the work we do is primarily debt. It is also across the globe. So we reach 100 countries and across multiple sectors. So very broad, very diverse. And with that, we really think of our work as having three layers of impact. Uh, one is investor. Another is the portfolio. So the impact we're having on our borrowers, the investee, and then ultimately the community. So the end user of the capital. And where we found that we really have the deepest impact is in that middle layer, uh, portfolio impact. And as we've gone on, and as you shared at the top, you know, we've been at this 30 years, we're starting to see that we actually have two distinct um, investor contributions in this middle layer. One is at the time of investment and our ongoing investment in that intermediary. Uh, in our due diligence process, um, as we structure our investment, the friendliness, the flexibility that we use is, is adding investor contribution, also on an ongoing basis. So for some first-time fund managers, for example, um, you know, interesting one, one might think that our loan administration team provides enormous amount of investor contribution because for oftentimes these are for these managers, their first time interacting with a lender. And so what does that mean as it relates to payments, to relationships with co-lenders, uh, to providing reporting, impact and financial, you know, we help them along that path and that is enormous investor contribution. But over time, what we've seen, and I think, you know, the public will see this more from us, is that um, as managers mature, as asset classes mature, there's an opportunity for us to connect capital markets with these communities more deeply because the business we're in is really those markets that have been overlooked, that don't have good access to capital. And that's generally because there's not an easy way for investors to engage in those investments. So more and more, we're starting to create products and services that allow ease, affordability, and reliability to access to capital. And those new products, which will be separate from our core product, is where we're seeing we're adding some really deep investor contribution in building financial markets. And so we report this all back to our investors through an annual impact report. But I think the second piece is where um, we're trying to work with others to really educate and share that there's this intermediation, this financial markets that needs to be matured so that impact capital can flow from investor to communities in the way that communities need. Got it. What a great role, Jen. I love that example. I mean, you see so much, you're able to add so much design value to, to the market. So really, really appreciate, appreciate that example. Um, Tang, I'd like to come, I'd like to come back to you uh, with a question of how scientific this should be. Like when you're implementing impact value creation strategies, are you measuring very precisely the potential financial value of a specific initiative uh, th that could be created as a result of that intervention? Um, yeah, no, that's that's a really, really great uh, question, Ben, because to me, um, um, scientific rigor or, or just rigor in general is probably the most important thing for all of us, either in the in impact in investment industry or just in the investment industry in general to get right, right? So this is um, particularly important for all of us who are in this industry right now, because, you know, whether it's sustainability or, or impact, because we all know, right, everybody who's here knows that the industry is really exploding. It's really getting a lot of attention. And there will be, you know, inevitably people who greenwash, impact wash, who are opportunistic and are just saying the right things to raise money, right? We will have people like that. So if we don't have rigor, if we don't have scientific rigor to, to, to this, to, to the impact investing um, approach, 
Uh, and if we don't show results in a couple of years, um, that's going to be bad for the whole industry, right? And we will not be able to contribute to solving the social and environmental challenges that we that we said we're going to solve. So, and by the way, so that's why I think it's great that organizations like Tideline, you know, you guys are hosting these substantive conversations in addition to helping impact funds globally, right, on, on their impact strategy, on their impact value creation. In terms of actually quantifying financial value of impact um, uh, of, of impact value creation uh, initiatives, um, I think it's still fair to say that a lot of us are still working on it. There's still a lot to do. Um, and for us, for bearing uh, private um, equity Asia, um, you know, we're not an impact investor, right? We're not marketing any of our funds as a, as impact funds. So, you know, I can't claim that we're doing the full suite of impact investing methodology. But there are things that we have started to do. Um, you know, some just even out of our standard ESG approach that could actually be very applicable to impact investors as well. Um, one example is that we recently looked at a logistics deal in Asia, uh, where a key component of our value creation plan is to uh, potentially transition them to uh, transition the fleet to to a, to a less carbon intensive one and transition the warehouses into smart warehouse, uh, warehouses, which is both more energy efficient and safer for the workers, right? So during due diligence, we actually modeled the impact base case, the, the upside case and the downside case, right? Just like how we model any other operational improvement topic, right? So for example, we actually mapped the potential customers that we could gain if we made our services more environmentally friendly. And we also mapped that the customers we would lose if we didn't do it, right? So you, you could argue this is more on the ESG side versus the impact side, uh, but I can see that this is something an impact investor could potentially invest in and work on as well, right? right got it. Um, but, but of course, you know, we're not doing this for every deal yet, and I'm sure the methodology needs you know, more rigor, but I think this is a good start, and I think you know, impact investors shouldn't shy away from that, from that rigor. Yeah. Got, got it. Th thank you, Tang. Um, Emma, the, the next question to you, and I think we've had a question from the audience too, which is very similar to the one that I'll ask, which, which relates to evidence of investor contribution. You mentioned SJF's robust impact measurement and management practices for which, you know, SJF is definitely known in the market. Um, my sense is that best practice and impact management is increasingly being perceived as the ability to provide evidence of the contribution you're making. I'm just curious how you approach that at SJF. Sure. Yeah, this is a tricky one. I think uh, a lot of folks are starting to, to think about this um, and it's not super clear how, how the kind of industry will come together to do this yet. But I think it is a balance of managing for qualitative measurement of contribution and quantitative. Um, I think that a lot of funds to date, including SJF, have really relied on that qualitative approach where you can talk about um, you know, the impact metrics that you're measuring for, and you can watch those grow over time as you work with companies. So that, that gets a bit at the quan, but when you think about how you're actually working with the portfolio, you can tell stories, you can write case studies, you can think about, you know, I, I made this many introductions, it led to these other you know, flywheel effects taking place. But what we're trying to be more thoughtful about is um, taking that bird's eye view of the portfolio and trying to map out exactly where we are either intervening or contributing or designing projects with companies and trying to keep it really balanced across different practices. So one way that we've bucketed it, which might be helpful for others, is thinking about this idea of impact acceleration, which I described before. So the hands-on tactical projects with companies, whether those are bespoke at single prop, uh, companies at a time or multiple companies at once, or at a whole portfolio level where maybe we're providing a best practice guide for diversity, equity, and inclusion, for example. So it's um, thinking through that bucket of work, then also thinking about how we're measuring the analytics that we're working on and the research that we're doing, whether it's for, again, a company at a time or 
the broader portfolio or industries that we're working in. So it's a bit more of that research and measurement work, uh, a bit more numerical in nature. And then the third bucket is thinking about impact reporting and publications and press and field building and things that get at the broader industry and sharing what we've learned. And I think um, the, the industry has really been grounded for many years in measuring and reporting and measuring and reporting. And now we're starting to think more about managing for impact. And so we really want to keep those three buckets balanced across our work, perhaps even more heavily taking our time into the impact acceleration piece of what we're really trying to build out and do for our portfolio companies to create that contribution and value. So um, within that, I think uh, it can be difficult, like I mentioned before, but we're putting numbers to some of the impact uh, via projects like um, one we just did on the SDGs and not just mapping at the target level about business model, but thinking about building out under each target that a particular company was addressing um, ways to measure against the status quo or measure against what the target's goals are. So I'm um, really trying again to put research and numbers to contribution of that company and then SJF's work with the company to get there. Um, we built out a carbon mitigation model to look at portfolio level carbon efforts um, to try to reduce uh, and mitigate climate change across um, our environmentally focused companies. Um, we're thinking a lot about diversity measurement and looking at, you know, what does board make up diversity look like today? What does it look like, you know, 12 months from now? Did SJF make any of those introductions to networks that are focused on diverse uh, recruiting or did we not? And did they happen organically on their own? So it's trying to, again, take that bird's eye view, look at the macro before diving into the specific work that we're doing. And again, trying to be as quantitative as possible, but we're getting there. I think a lot is still going to be uh, focused on qualitative as we move towards creating these models for measuring contribution. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Emma. J Jen, I'd like to turn to, to you. Um, you know, SJF has has Emma, Learn has has Matt. Not every investor, I'm sure, you know, can have superstars like Emma and Matt on their team. I'm just curious as you, you know, look across your portfolio of intermediaries, how are you seeing organizations build the capacity to do this work, to staff this work? And what have you learned yourself at Calvert about how to operationalize, um, you know, providing contribution? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I actually have flashbacks to the gender conversation um, as you were sharing that with me, because um, for us, as I shared before, our portfolio is diverse. It goes across countries, impact sectors, and stage of maturity. So we do see a lot of variation. Um, similar to gender, context matters. I, I don't think this is a cut and paste exercise. And Emma was articulating this nimbleness, which I loved, you know, this ability to see what your investee needs, um, understand to the maturation of that sector. You know, some sectors are more mature and there's more data, there's more track record, there's different interventions we can make on an impact side versus more nascent sectors, where perhaps the data and the standards are just starting to form a norm and there's even some contribution in that part of the um, impact analysis. And so that you know, ability to staff it um, in a nimble way, I think has been one thing we've noticed. So some, um, you know, they have one person perhaps providing TA, um, others have this integrated more fully in their operations, and they could be, you know, building relationships with community. Um, they could be thinking about how to promote the industry's best practices and doing more thought leadership beyond just what the community and the investment strategy of their fund is. So we see a broad range and um, kind of like gender, we have a theory of um, helping people um, move along a spectrum that makes sense. So we want to share what we see from other parts of our portfolio. Um, as best practices emerge, we like to um, help people um, see what we're seeing um, to hope that we all move in a way that is um, adding value and progressing. So I think it's dynamic and it's not one and done day one. It's something that evolves and um, we learn from each other. Got it. Got it. Th thanks, Jen. Um, Hope, uh, Jen had mentioned that many of the investments uh, that Calvert's making are, are debt investments. Uh, and it brings me back to the point you had made earlier about where HCAP sits as a mezzanine debt investor. And I'm just curious if you could unpack that a little bit more. I know the 
assumption many listeners may have is that it's more difficult to have contribution as a debt investor, period, uh, just given there's less control in that situation. But uh, but I may be wrong and we may be making assumptions that uh, that, that deserve to be responded to. So I, um, I'd welcome your reflections on how HCAP maximizes your own contribution, even as a, a debt investor. No, I think that's that's correct, right? So, you know, as primarily a mis debt investor, we are in a unique position as typically we're not in, in control, uh, unlike some of our peers who are doing majority equity transactions, right? So I think the one thing that actually changes things for us a bit is we're typically the first institutional investor which allows us to have a bit of an outside influence on corporate governance, value creation strategies, impact strategies, recruiting, um, you know, all the things management teams are thinking of as they get ready to scale their business. So they they tend to almost look at us as an equity investor in that scenario, right? So that allows us to sort of have this clear conversation around what impact means for us, how we see it being implemented in the business, what it means in terms of outcomes for the business, value creation, growing the business, scaling, recruiting, retention. And I think that story tends to you know, sit well with the management teams, right? They, they're dealing with a lot of different issues, trying to grow a business and just having a value-added partner who comes and helps articulate some of those things, who brings resources around the table, uh, who can help them in executing on some of these uh, strategies is always well received from our perspective, right? And so when we have this conversation around sort of impact, the impact roadmap, uh, and what it means in terms of growing the business, we tend to see a lot of alignment with the management teams we're working with. Um, We also implement information and reporting covenants in our loan docs. These cover impact implementation and reporting, including covering uh, working with our third-party software platform that collects all the impact metrics we track. So Mm -hmm. the companies sign up in the loan docs to provide these metrics uh, on a quarterly basis to our third-party software provider. Uh, They also sign up for a semi-annual check-in. They also sign up for employee engagement surveys. So there's, there's all these things they sign up to in our loan docs. Now, to be clear, uh, not providing all these things is is not an event of default, but it does allow us to provide a little more sort of structure around what we're trying to achieve and what the information we're trying to get from the companies. Um, We'll also spend a lot of time up front just informing the management teams on the benefits of the gainful jobs approach, particularly in terms of employee retention and recruitment, right, which is a key challenge for businesses in the low middle market especially in this environment. And a lot of the management teams are thinking about these things, right? They're struggling with recruiting, struggling with retention. And if we can show them that, hey, by implementing the strategy, it has this effect on recruiting and retention, that helps sort of drive buy-in as well from the from the management teams. Got it. Got it. I hope you also see things from your perspective as the chair of Impact Capital Managers, uh, is investor contribution a topic that's being discussed among peers? Yeah, no, that's it's a big topic, right? So for those who are not aware, uh, Impact Capital Managers is a peer network member group for impact funds. Uh, we now have about 85 member funds representing more than $36 billion in impact-focused capital uh, who have invested collectively in over 1,300 portfolio companies and supporting north of 160,000 jobs. So there is, it's a large organization with a very solid uh, member group. And, you know, to Ben's question, for our members, impact value creation is top of mind, right? We think, like most of the panelists have, have, who've spoken have said, is we think there's strong alignment between impact and value creation, right? So most of our members are either deploying impact value creation strategies across their portfolio investments or are working to sort of get to that stage, right? And so what ICM does is we try and work with our members, not only to share best practices, but to also provide them with the resources for those newer, smaller members who are thinking about implementing these practices on how to go about that, right? So we uh, set up workshops, we have convenings, uh, we have a member-only portal that includes resources members can leverage uh, to drive value creation across their portfolio. Um, And we're also working on a research study, Alpha and Impact 2.0, identifying impact value at exit, 
which is intended to equip our, to equip our members, key stakeholders, uh, including the next generation of impact investors with a more sophisticated understanding of the relationship between impact and financial return. Mm. And uh, hopefully Ben will be able to work on another report together soon with Tideline, because I think <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of sort of data that's now around the table, given the size of our membership. And I think that uh, providing this, you know, this, this data in a format that others can read, can sort of dive into, only helps with sort of knowledge, knowledge development in the space. Well, well, that's exciting. I will look forward to seeing that research and, and joining you in, on that journey. Um, Matt, Matt, turning to you, you mentioned a lot about the concept of connectivity earlier, connectivity to other kinds of institutions, to your LPs, around the subject of you know, human development. And um, we'd just love to hear you share an example of, of where Learn you know, has stepped in and been able to you know, add real impact value in a way that, that's been unique. Yeah, so I think you know, what I maybe start with is, and, and I'm sure Emma faces the same challenges, you know, we have a portfolio of you know, 100 companies and at all different stages and all different levels of ownership that we have in those companies. So how you actually build value across a portfolio that broad is really challenging because there's, you know, we don't have infinite resources around the impact management work. And so I think this notion of platforms is where I've really been focusing is how do we build platforms or intermediate intermediated solutions that can add value across multiple portfolio companies to create a broader opportunity for scale. And so an example that I'll share in that regard is around, um, how we pull together this platform that serves underserved markets um, through funding and research and accessing public funding streams. And so we have a really cool partnership with the Urban League of Central Florida. There's a gentleman there, Glenn Gilsey, and if you, if you ever haven't met him, incredible leader. And we've been talking with them effectively in how do you take um, their platform, which is, you know, pretty large, starts in Central Florida, but scales across the country. They have direct access to low-income families in their communities. They also have a really strong ability to influence policy. And so what we've been working with them on is taking a charter school um, investment. We have another um, investment that focuses on early childhood reading assessment and intervention, and then a holistic health model that provides a broad range of services, including mental health, to figure out how essentially urbanly could be a broker to help those companies get traction in the underserved markets, develop pilot strategies, and then unlock public funding streams such as vouchers, Medicaid funding, Workforce Investment Act dollars to support those companies. And so in the conversations we have with them, um, the role that uh, Urban League is playing is enlisting pilot partners. Um, so finding the schools, the institutions, the faith-based institutions, primary care physicians who could be partners on the ground, identifying those funding streams that could actually pay for the services over time. And then we have partners, uh, we have a partnership with Stanford University and a researcher, uh, education economist, Eric Hanischek, who's helping to design some of the pilot strategies to prove out these early stage ventures at a small scale that then if they work, um, creates a strong appeal for public funding to support some of these solutions. And so again, like our perspective is largely that there's an opportunity for venture backed um, solutions to create broad scale around some social problems that have been intractable for a long time. That's our thesis. So I think, you know, finding partners like that is a really uh, exciting opportunity for us to start in Central Florida. And if it works, then you can imagine a um, urban league network and start scaling across the country and taking those solutions to other states. And so that's kind of what the types of strategies that we're working on, um, thinking how do we get out of the one-off game because we don't have capacity to do that to too, with too many portfolio companies before we just bury ourselves. Got it, got it. What a, what a great uh, example, Matt. And I think it's a good comment to finish on actually it's it's been fantastic to have have you all on we've had some excellent questions come through very focused on data so i think we'll come back to, to data i'm sure that topic will come up and um look forward hope to exploring what impact capital managers is doing there but thank you so much jen hope tang emma matt you know for joining us uh for for the compass series thank you for joining us and tuning in we'll look forward to having you at the next event uh, and uh, please do visit us at tideline.com and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. But thanks, everyone.